Okay, sometimes it's better to show a little bit of a longer case. Um, and this is a tough diabetic patient who has a lot of mid peripheral traction. And I think it's good to just go through how these cases can be difficult, even for someone who's been in the retina space doing surgery for quite a while uh, and enjoys tackling, you know, tough situations. This patient really tested that. Um, you can see first, I'm trying to find a plane by doing vitrectomy peripherally here. This patient has some old dehemoglobinized vitreous hemorrhage peripherally, and I'm trying to get under that to create a surgical uh, plane between the vitreous and the retina, and I do so, but the problem is, is that that mid-peripheral vitreous between the superior temporal arcade and past the equator is just locked down. It is so tight and so uh, bound to that retina surface that it doesn't create a lot of access to get the rest of the vitreous and then the fibrotic tissue up. So I'm going to move around. And I find that if I get stuck in one spot that I'm not having things kind of go as quickly as I want or go the direction I want, I want to just move and continually be active in the eye, but in a purposeful way. So I'm trying to, you know, just do peripheral vitrectomy. Uh, but I found that this inferior area is my best area. So I'm working diligently along it. I don't put forceps in the eye in this case. I don't go in and try to peel. I like forceps for peeling fibrotic tissue, but mainly if we have a good access point over the optic nerve. And this was just really too plaque down. So I'm going to try to use my cutter here as a forcep uh, and as a pick. So I'm actually using it as a pick to get under this vitreous tissue. This tissue is actually a little more translucent and it's a little bit more difficult to see, but I'm able to see how the retina responds around it. As I get under it, I can kind of see that I'm lifting something up. I see the retina respond. And now my goal is to get enough space that I can get my cutter in there and start to segment. And so I do, I have a little success there. Uh, and so now I'm trying to isolate this area of traction and work along that area. I always tell our fellows uh, that diabetic patients and diabetic surgery is like uh, defusing a bomb. You don't know how long you have. Sometimes patients start to feel sick. Sometimes their back hurts or they get the pains that prohibit them from being able to stay flat on the table for two, three hours. So you want to work expeditiously. And so I always feel like there's an added pressure in these situations to try and get this done, you know, really as, as efficiently as possible. Um, and, but in a case like this, I'm really kind of struggling to f really get a rhythm and to start to get some dissection points and whatnot. Now here, I actually am able to use this cutter like a pick again and like a forcep, and I'm actually starting to peel some of that fibrotic tissue off of the optic nerve. I'm watching the other tissue around it because I don't want to create any breaks. So as I lift this, I'm actually seeing how the tissue responds. And once I get that vitreous up, now I've got a, an area where I can actually segment. And I create a nice segmentation trough there nasally to separate that inferior plaque that's along the inferior temporal arcade and that, uh, that more nasal traction that we see here. Now, this line of fibrosis along the supranasal arcade, I'm going to end up leaving that uh, because that really wasn't exerting any significant traction. Here I'm actually able, just by kind of aspirating and seeing the vitreous and the retinal tissue react, find some uh, an edge over the macula, and I'm able to elevate that and now work on that temporal edge of that little fibrotic plaque that we have along the superior temporal arcade. And I'm feeling like I'm, I'm having some positive movement here. That's a really dangerous plaque right there. If you just go in and just aspirate and pull, you're going to create a break right there. And you create a break in a patient that has some mature and difficult to get off fibrosis, uh, you're in trouble. And the patient's in trouble. Uh, I'm going to diathermize. The one thing you don't want to do is have a lot of blood in a case like this. So I'm going to increase my pressure to control hemostasis. And as soon as I see any bleeding, 
I'm going to take the time to get that diathermy in there. I think when I was a younger surgeon, I didn't diathermize as much as I should, and it really created some difficult situations in cases. Now I'm going to tackle this big plaque, and uh, normally I'm going to work from the inside out. I'm going to try to find a plane and get this fibrosis elevated, starting along that supratemporal arcade. Instead, in this situation, the best access point I have is actually where I was able to get that vitreous up. So I'm going to work right along that area more peripherally and I'm lifting and just trying to create any space to get my 25 gauge bevel cutter in there and uh, this is uh, this is a huge blow here for freedom uh, from this fibrosis as I'm able to actually elevate that plaque and reflect it back on itself and and when you start to get something like this up um, and you see that there's some pulling on the retina Stopping and going back to doing some core and letting fluid do some of the work for you can be really essential. Here now we're going to attack it from the other direction. I'm going to aspirate. And once I aspirate, I'm actually able to then lift it. And now I'm going to cut and I create a nice segmentation there. Uh, so I like to segment my cases uh, and my patients with diabetic fibrosis. So now that I've got that segmentation, now I'm just dealing with this plaque along the superior arcade. It's pretty mobile. I can get my cutter on one side and really use this amazing high-speed cutter that allows me to kind of aspirate and cut along the edge of the fibrosis. And it'll just fold into your cutter uh, as long as you're right on the edge of it. And you can just tap the edge of it and it'll just flip into your cutter and actually allow you to get that fibrosis uh, off of there without having to aspirate and pull. Now this is a large plaque of vitreous um, here inferior to the nerve and it's in the mid periphery and it's difficult to see. The other fibrosis I've been able to see, but this is translucent vitreous here. And this is a big plaque that has an area that's being pulled on there. So I'm going to work along that area, decide that it's not time yet to get that up. And we're going to go back and start working here on this separation between some of this nasal vitreous and this uh, fi linear fibrotic plaque. Uh, not really sure why we got some air bubbles there, but with aspirating and lifting, I'm actually able to get a little space there. And now I can just go with my cutter over that area and remove that vitreous that's now up off of the retina, so it's not going to cause an issue. Back to working on this area again. We're just going to lift, and I'm watching to see how is it pulling. Uh, how is it pulling on that plaque along the supranasal arcade? How is it pulling inferiorly? That's the place where you could really run into trouble, is if there's some distal traction that's attached to that vitreous. And as you try and lift, it's going to actually pull there. So we've got a space elevated. I'm going to shave along that uh, plaque that's there. And now we're going to work a little bit more nasally. And this is where we actually get a big blow for freedom here, as we like to say. Uh, I'm able to actually lift up a big sheet of vitreous, and that really helps move things along. I've decided at this point I've eliminated all traction from this fibrotic plaque along the supranasal arcade, and I'm just going to leave the rest of that alone. Um, that plaque or that vitreous inferiorly did come up when I got that uh, big elevation of the hyloid about 30 seconds ago in our video. And so I'm going to add in PRP laser. This patient had had previous PRP. They had anti-VEGF injections, which really essential for these patients uh, prior to this kind of surgery because you can get a lot of hemorrhaging. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and go to air. That just helps uh, with wound closure. It helps reduce the chance of recurrent hemorrhaging. And air is out of there in about three or four days. And then I'm going to suture up this patient because I don't want any postoperative hypotony that can lead to bleeding. Thanks for watching.